How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, and Sundays with Andrew Zarian. Hey, it's Thursday on the show, and you know what that means. Got a lot to talk about. Revolution yesterday was the go-home show. I'm sorry, Dynamite yesterday was the go-home show for Revolution. And we have a number of matches announced for the show. I presume more will be added for the pre-show, etc. on the Collision and Rampage shows. But we're going to go over the full lineup, some thoughts on all the matches, some changes, which were very weird, as we'll get to later on, and plenty more. We've also got a lot of news. Billy Jack Haynes officially charged second-degree murder of his wife. Elijo Del Vikingo... Knee surgery. Going to be out a long time. Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns scheduled for a number of SmackDown shows, which means this show is going to do gigantic numbers over the next several weeks. We have a former WWE writer. Allegations against Vince McMahon this time is that he was fired for changing a script against Vince's wishes, which we will talk about here today. And, of course, we have also got updates on Julia, WWE sponsors, Gunter. He is returning to his hometown for a WWE show coming up. And uh, NXT TV numbers, which were not good, and it deserved it. And uh, plenty more. If you want to text us here today, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. F4W Online at gmail.com F4W online on threads Instagram and Cameo at Brian Alvarez on Twitter back in a moment Observer Live fish could swim this far offshore. Yeah. Shoulders ran like the wind, but he could find no peace.
Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. You trying to stir up trouble here with his Oli thing? No. You're an idiot. Why would you say that? How dare I you? I saw you on the on the chat here say, why don't you ask Brian about Oli? Listen, I'll take y'all behind the scenes. Questions. I'll take y'all behind the scenes. You guys like the uh, the Dave show? You guys like the Granny show? Yeah. Okay. Both of them. Nothing like real life. <laughs> the stuff you don't hear with Granny before we go on the air is better than what's on the air half the time. And uh, the Dave show is always an adventure. So, before we record with Dave, I say, what do you want to talk about? Actually, I, I, my exact words are always, what do we got today? I'm very patterned with this whole thing. And so Dave starts running down a list of things he wants to talk about. And, you know, he mentions uh, Mike Jones, Ole, and then he goes on to the next thing, Dynamite. And I'm like, okay, I, I write them all down. So we start the show, and we talk about Virgil. And then I said, uh, or we might have actually done the Ole thing first, but I think it was Virgil. And then I said... Well, what else do we got on Oli today? And he goes, I don't know. You have any questions? I was like, what? Why did you hit me with that? You told me <laughs> that a topic was Oli, and then I bring it up, and then you throw it at me? And then he goes, well, I thought you said you were going to have some questions. Yeah. And I was like, well, not me. I said, if you have questions for the mailbag, <laughs> if you have questions about Oli, send them to the mailbag, and we'll do them on Wednesday. Well, nobody sent in any questions. So I get... Put on the back burner. It's like, bro, you guys want me to talk about Oli on a show with Dave? Well, like, you you are you kidding me? Me for questions to give Dave? I mean, you know. Well, you didn't give me any. You could have sent it to the mailbag too, brother. You didn't mailbag ask. at wrestlingobserver.com. dot com. I, I try to look at our relationship as one of coworkers, as one is, you know, as working together here, not just me sending you questions in some random mailbag. I'm trying to work with you to make the show with Dave better, and I could have done that. You want so, the timestamp you know. for it here, buddy? It's right at the beginning of the show. It's not hard to find. <laughs> the first thing he does, throw me right under that bus. Oh, man. And then, of course, he had to do the classic, hey, have you watched such and such? <laughs> Which was like some, I don't even know what it was. I was like, no, I have not watched that yet. The DDT match, was it? The, I, uh... No, I don't think so. <laughs> have you watched but then, that one yet? You know, some other idiot on the board. One of those guys that now he's so mad he's going to quit. I've heard that before. <laughs> but he's like, ah, you know, Brian never watches anything. I'm like, I watch all sorts of stuff. Well, you know, you do, every time Dave asks, well, yeah. So if Dave asks that I watch something and I say no... That means I haven't watched it yet. It doesn't mean I'm never going to watch it. I'll tell you a good example. You know when I finally watched that uh, Michael Oku match, Will uh -huh. Ospreay? Yeah. I don't know, like three, four days ago, long after it aired. But I watched it. I finally watched it because I got a lot of stuff I got to do. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. I'm a busy, busy man. So you're saying but, that you don't have time to but, watch All Japan when you're asking about it? Let me tell you something. <laughs> That gall darn match was so awesome. Was that game? was the best match of the year. Mm. I'll fight y'all. Oh. I love that that uh, Brian Danielson Zack Saber Jr. match, and uh, I'm sure there are others that people have brought up as well. I haven't seen the uh, uh, you know the Alexander match on on TNA. But that was good. Let me tell you something, brother. This match with Michael Oku and Will Ospreay. I have a full review on Tuesday's Brian and Vinny show. I could have gone on for hours. Oh, my God. This match was so great. And, like, everything about it. The the athleticism, the storytelling, the payoffs of big spots at the end. Uh, my only review, I will just say this and I will move on because we got a lot to talk about, is it was one of those matches that I watched about two weeks after it took place, maybe a week and a half, two weeks or whatever. I knew the finish. Like, not only did I know who won, but I knew the actual finish, okay? But this match was so good that I thought I'd slipped into another timeline. I'm like, there was a spot at the end where I'm like, that's it. It's done. There's, it's like, I don't know who lied to me or why, <laughs> but Michael Oku is not winning this match with that half crab falling back into the deal. But he did. That's when you know you watched a good match 
when they fooled you and you even knew what the finish was because it had taken place weeks prior. It was so great. So go watch it, everybody. It's was worth it, Yes. Was it better than Maxine and Valhalla? I don't want to get onto that here today. And that's another one, David. You know, we're limited on time. This is another this is another good one. So well, every time we don't review NXT, we have a buddy who, you know, he's like, Oh, I see you can't talk about NXT. <laughs> I go out of my way to try to make sure we got time. And we almost had time yesterday, but then Dave does the old, I don't want to talk about this, but I guess I will. And I know right then it's like, wait, you don't want to talk about it. Don't. But he talked about it. He was grinding his gears. And then gears. we had no time. He had to get it out. It was cathartic. I can understand. Yes. Hey, listen. If I had a dollar for every time that someone told me I sucked... I would be like that guy that bought all that land in Hawaii. <laughs> I would own Oahu, and uh, that's it. That's it. <laughs> anyway, we got a lot to talk uh, about here today. Yes, we do. Well, actually, we'll start with the bad news. Billy Jack Haynes transported to jail, being officially charged with the murder of his wife. Now, I don't want to talk too much about this okay because you know this all has not really come out publicly but i mean we talked about it on the observer radio show if you want to hear it you can listen to that but the the gist of it is you know the word in wrestling circles was that he allegedly told the police why he killed his wife okay we probably shouldn't have talked about it yesterday but dave's actually written about it and uh and he talked about it yesterday but here's the thing. If you if you know, and if you don't listen to the show last night, I don't like doing this stuff, but whatever. What he said, okay, what he claimed, allegedly, was the reason that he killed his wife. To me, that doesn't sound like second-degree murder, which would be murder without premeditation, Okay. If the reason that he killed her is the reason that he allegedly claimed, that seems like something that would have been premeditated. So I don't know what's going on, but he has been charged with second degree murder, which means that he killed her, but he did not plan it in advance. And that's also different from manslaughter, which would be it would have been accidental. You know, they're they're claiming that he did it on purpose, but it was not premeditated. And he is in custody. And presumably we're going to know more, you know, as as time goes on here. But, man, this is a terrible story. Ugly, ugly, ugly story. And who knows what his psychological condition is, too, because I'm sure that's going to be called into this as well, too. I agree with you. It certainly sounds like it's that way. If he, in his mind, that it was a mercy killing, that he thought about this and planned, I, I don't. I don't know. I just know it is an awful situation. And, you know, and I hate to ask you this because I'm sure the answer is no, but that woman was related, I thought, to a independent wrestler. Has well, anyone... I, I'll tell you exactly because I know all of it. Because has anyone heard Billy, from him? Billy, he's dead. Oh, okay, okay. Billy Jack Haynes, I forget the guy's name, but he was friends with this independent wrestler for years and years i can actually probably find his name right now but he knew him for i'm talking decades okay because if you remember the uh short-lived portland wrestling reboot that uh whenever you see the clips of me and miss rent to own and you know that was that was portland wrestling on the wb and this todd b craft was his buddy's name and he was a wrestler and he actually wrestled in a tag title match on the very last episode of the Portland Wrestling Reboot on the WB. I may have even met him for all I know, because I was there. But anyway, uh, this Todd B. Craft, he'd known him since he was like nine. And his mother, it was Billy Jack Haynes' wife. So she was like 15 years older than Billy. And Todd B. Craft just died uh, last year. So I can go more into this after the break, but that's generally how they're connected. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Talk to us about the process of bringing her in and yeah. just how you felt about that. Uh, 
listen, more than anything, I can identify with people coming out of another company and maybe feeling like they never got utilized to their fullest potential. And, you know, that's how she felt. And I didn't know Ash before. And of course, we, you know, it's a small world, the wrestling world, whether you know people or not, you feel like you know them, you know of them, you know, people, you know, there's always a connection. And so many people were telling me, you know, she wants to work. She wants to do something, you know, generally she could go say to AEW or something like that. And you just never know what's going to happen. At least I think we are known for at least pretty much when someone comes into our company, we're going to utilize them. Um, I think that's a known fact and people can just sit back and watch our product and see that. And also the knockouts division is also, Hey, we averaged three female matches on a pay-per-view. Uh, we pretty much use every single girl in that locker room. Um, that's enticing to talent, right? And they want to be used and they want to, and I've heard about her work ethic. She's really expressed and every other person that worked with her vouched for her work ethic. I respect that. You know, I, I like those people who are hungry and want it and want to add something to our division. And I think she's going to be a great addition. I think she's already made a splash and now let's see what she's got in the ring and everything else. And I can't wait to see her new character and what she wants to bring to it. She's excited. Um, so I think the fans are going to be pleasantly surprised, right? I just can never give her enough props because of not only the performer that she is, but the human being that she is. You know, she's never changed from the girl that I met in NXT. I worked with her. I think people forget when she first came into WWE because I was there on the main roster. And she would, and of course, everyone coming into the company is going to be all timid and nice. She's never changed from that person. If anything, she's only gotten better. She is so, it's a testament when you see her interact with the fans and how much they love her and all her loyal fans. And, the love that she gives back. So I'm talking about outside the ring right now and to see her in the ring. Listen, we can already, we already know she's a star, right? And to see her level up in the ring, because obviously we have a great division. We give the girls a lot of time. We feature them a lot, main events. She has killed it. And I think it just, opened up this confident, newfound confidence for her as well. And I, I remember her when she came into the company, I wasn't there actually, I was doing Amazing Race at the time for her debut, I missed that. I had dealt, I had talked to her before. And then I saw, I mean, she had her first match with Kylan King, which was off the charts. I got the show. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VB, also WrestlingObserver.com. So, yes, long story short, Billy Jack Haynes married the mother of his best friend, I believe after his best friend passed away. And I think that uh, Billy was 70, she was 85, somewhere around there. Yeah, I think that's what it was. So that was the, that was the story. Mm. All right, uh, Elijo Del Vikingo, knee surgery today. He is dealing with a torn meniscus and a ruptured ligament, and he is going to be out of action a long time. So that sucks. Yeah. Well, and uh, he's been he's missed a lot of action, and I know what would he be without doing what he does? And you know, it was kind of a freakish thing where he got hurt at Arena Lopez Mateos a couple of weeks ago. You know, that could have happened in any match, but I see a guy that young with knees like this, with hips like this. I mean, it's just, I hope he can last, and I hope when he comes back he can kind of temper his game a little bit, change it up enough just to elongate his career some more. But, uh, I mean, this is a rough run of injuries for him at a time where, you know, this should have been part of this time where in the last year or so we've been seeing more and more of a Kingo, and he's doing more in the States, and it just unfortunately because of injuries and other things, it hasn't happened. Hey, and then we've got uh, a lot of, you know, this is actually a very important story right here, even though it doesn't sound like it. Cody has been announced for the March 1st, March 8th, and March 15th editions of SmackDown. 
The Rock is also going to be on those same three shows. So, very, very likely, they're going to be involved in angles together on all three shows. But I bring this up, the, the important part, which is not really part of the story, is that on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com, it notes, it is not known if Rhodes will be appearing on television at all three events. He often wrestles dark matches after SmackDown episodes. You know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. That means when SmackDown is coming to your town, whether he's going to appear in an angle or not, or do anything on television, he is advertised as being there to sell tickets. This is the exact thing I've been asking AEW to do. Like, uh, you've got All a right. show coming up. Advertise some big names. It doesn't matter if you have a storyline for them. It doesn't matter if you know what you're going to be doing that day. What matters is you advertise your big stars as being there. And if there isn't a spot for them in your storytelling, fine. Work a match, work a dark match off air, okay? People want to see the big stars in wrestling matches. And it's a broken record, but, you know, what did we have? Like, they, they we had six things announced for Dynamite, and three of them they announced the day before the show. You got to sell tickets, dude. You got to get people into the building, and you got to give them the big stars that they want to see. That's it. That's well, not it, but that's right. a big thing. Well, it's, it helps. It's a tried and true thing when it comes to these television tapings, and it does not always work. It's not always a guarantee you're going to get people in the building, but it is something that every promotion that had TV tapings in an arena did, whether it be WWF, whether it be Jim Crockett Promotions, whoever. After all of these non-competitive squash matches, which is not the case nowadays, now sometimes, you know, you got too many, too much action going on. But still, after all of that TV, if your big names, Dusty or the Rock and Roll Express or whoever weren't going to be on, they had a match together. Or even if they were on TV, you had a match that was a big match that made people want to come to the show and see that match. And I don't know if AEW's got that right now, but... Frankly, you throw everything at the wall that you can and you put as many big stars and you announce as many stars as you possibly can to be there, even if they don't have a role. I mean, not to just use the name Britt Baker. We, you know, pull that one a lot here. But, like, if you're going to Ohio or Pennsylvania, where, use Britt to come out and be there. Do an autograph signing. Do a lot more of that sort of stuff. It cannot hurt you right now. And it cannot cost you as much extra money as you spend in other places. I mean, no offense to Soraya's brother, Zach, uh, whatever his name is. He was just signed by AEW. Zach Knight? Why? And I hate to say... As a favor is, to his sister. But, and that's the thing. It's like... But again, it's another name. It's just another body on the roster. So I I don't know. I, I don't know. I, to me, with the amount of money you get spent doing other things, with so many of these other things that are pulled from the past, you know, really drilling home this thing about selling these house shows and selling these TV tapings and making sure that they're big events and riling the troops as much as you can, again, I don't know what the answer is, but they got to do a better job of it. And your answer is one of the simplest things they can do is just add as many, ma add a big match at the end. Add Darby against in, in a in a six man or something with Sting on the outside or just whatever you do, make it as glossy as you can to try, try, try to drive people in. All righty. Oh, this person here, Brian, you mentioned sometimes talent doesn't even know if they're on these shows. Do you know when they find out they're booked? That's like, crazy. Is it the Tuesday before Dynamite? Bro, hey, listen. <laughs> yes, sir. Dude. I I don't want to compare this to, like, WWE back in the day, but it is very, very much like that. And a lot of people are very frustrated because they don't find out the Tuesday before like some people do. I mean, some people will know what they're doing because, like, there are a couple of matches usually advertised in advance. But most people are showing up the day of the show, and they find out whether they're doing anything or not. 
and there's very little communication. People are very, I've been hearing about this for months. People are very frustrated. Like, they show up, here's what you're going to do. Lots of people will complain, and it gets changed, which is also a big problem I hear about all the time. People don't want to do something, and Tony doesn't make them do it. And so, you know, there's a lot of this. And, you know, people aren't going to come forward and talk about it publicly. They will someday. This is one of those things where people will say I'm wrong now. And then, you know, someday people are going to talk and you'll realize that I'm actually not wrong. Unless I hear about this every NDA. single day. <laughs> and, you know, trying to put together these shows is just a whirlwind of can I can this will this person do this? They don't want to. What can we do? Will you do it? Blah, blah, blah. There is a lot, a lot, a lot of frustration. And, you know. There's Seems also like injuries that he deals with. And no, there are not shows put together a week in advance or two weeks in advance. The days of long-term booking, they're gone. He has an idea. You know, I'm sure he had a card for the pay-per-view. But as far as like week to week, how they get there, every week is like, what are we going to do this week? You know, he wants to do things, but people don't want to go along with it. People are hurt, whatever. And Somebody give me a historical example where that's worked. Well, I mean... With the exception of maybe somebody's going to argue ECW, you know, throw it all at the wall, and then in post-production we'll scrape it off and we'll see what we get. But, like, I mean, if you think about it, I don't know, Brian, you were a wrestler as talent. Wouldn't you want to know what of direction course. you're going? <laughs> you of know course. What I mean? And these don't seem like they're... Again, this is a problem where... That matchmaker Booker thing. And again, I don't want to pour all out because it's not like he's the only one there with ideas or the only one. I, but he's the last call. And it's a very frustrating thing to, to hear this and to see this type of stuff play out on TV where it feels like that's the case. And then to find out that it is the case, that things are that messy. I mean, again, it's one of those things where it comes to AEW that it is... W C it's the best of WCW sometimes and it's the worst of WCW sometimes and people saying no and then that being okay and then we'll we'll just have this pr trying to move pieces like this especially on a, a a show day is just seems to be insane to me it just doesn't seem like it's a good way to go about things Yeti Pot Pie says is that the reason they never announced matches or talent weeks ahead yes but like I said. It doesn't matter if you know what's going to happen the day of the show four weeks out. Book talent for that show, and if they end up in a segment on the show, then they work that segment. If you book a show and they're not scheduled for the actual television show, who cares? They work a dark match. That's it. That's how WWE does it. And they sell tickets, okay? They sell tickets because people buy tickets to see Cody, okay? They're not buying tickets to see specifically any match that Cody's in, but the company advertises Cody will be on SmackDown the next three yeah. weeks, okay? Well, I got three weeks. The show's three weeks from now. I want to see Cody. I buy a ticket, all right? Well, will he be on the show? Like, in an, I don't know, but you know what? I'm going to see him, and I'm going to see him wrestle. That's it. This is not difficult, okay? And another thing, I just want to throw this out there. If you think that I'm the only guy complaining about this, trust me, I'm not. Okay? I'm not. There are a lot of people in the company who are very smart who have suggested the same thing. Let's advertise some dark matches. So, I don't know. We'll see. Especially when it comes to their case where they don't have a name that can move a needle like Cody can. So they do have to rely on, you know, a group of people and probably a match. Just with a match that people are going to want to see. Something that would be interesting. Something that you could tape later on to show on TV. Or a superstar is on the super station if we're pulling from the past again. Or something like that down the line. I mean, you, you could also utilize that for content for later. There's just a better way to do things, and it's frustrating. I mean, look, the meat match got called off. Why would Wardlow, why should that guy have been in that position after that promo anyway? They just do a lot of things that are just very confusing to me. Back in a moment with more Observer Live.
Welcome to the special tour of Figure Four Weekly Headquarters, as promised. Today I will be accompanied by my assistant Vincenzo, so let's get moving. Hey, don't worry about it. Today's a special day, I'll drive. Vince, today's gonna be a good day, so let's not F anything up, okay? Now, I'd like to tell everybody, I just wanna give a short speech on the way to uh, the compound here today, and that is that we are going through very tough economic times right now. Right, Vince? It's a time of uh, stock market crashing, the yen is devalued, a time of woe and want. And many of you watching this right now, for all I know, are unemployed. But the good thing is, and I always like to look on the bright side, as Vince is well aware, the good news is that for every dark cloud, there is a silver lining. And the silver lining is that figure four weekly is doing great. It's a huge success right now. Subscriptions are up, quality is down, profit margins are skyrocketing, things are going very well. So the one thing is that I don't want to make it seem like money is everything because money cannot buy happiness, but what it can buy is enormous houses and that makes me happy. So. We will be going to see my enormous house, the Figure Four Weekly Compound. And uh, that's where we're heading right now. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, BB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. We'll talk about Dynamite here in a moment, but former WWE writer alleged he was fired in 2016 for changing a script against Vince's wishes. He worked with WWE twice, actually. 2001 to 2005, and then later returned in 2015 as a member of the creative team. So he wanted to make it very clear in his statement that he, he enjoyed working with WWE, he enjoyed working with all of his co-workers, but uh, he had an issue with, you'll never guess, Vince McMahon. He said that they were doing a segment, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, Raw 2016, and he said it was a segment involving Pac, Titus O'Neil, R-Truth, and Mark Henry. They were giving a script. They were given a script. And he looked at it. And he said it called for Neville to speak up and tell everyone else that he has got a dream. And the dream is to win the Royal Rumble. He said Neville came up to him afterwards and said, I cannot say this. Trying to compare a wrestler wants to one day win the Royal Rumble to one of the most iconic speeches in American history about civil rights and how important that was. To try and play on that was dumb. It was poor writing. Didn't make Le uh, Neville look like a face. Uh, said that'd be something a heel might say. But uh, he also said truth. Henry O'Neill also uncomfortable with it. 
Not only was uh, Neville uncomfortable, but they were as well. And they said, yes, this is effing terrible. So he decided, well, I'm going to try and do a rewrite here. And they changed the script to R-Truth delivering the I have a dream line in a, uh, how was it described here? Light and fun manner. So Dave Kapoor was Leonard's, uh, Leonardi's boss at the time, approved the scene but told him to tell Vince about the changes. So he went to explain to Vince and says, quote, I'll never forget this. He's staring at the screen. He takes off his headphones, and he turns to me and says, so you didn't give me what I wanted. I explained to him again what we did, the circumstances, the limitations, took full responsibility, and he just chewed me the F out, pardon my French. And the following day at the SmackDown taping, he was given the script, told that Titus needed to deliver it word for word. Took them two hours to shoot it. And he says, when you have a talent say, I'm not saying this, I'm not comfortable. You have three black wrestlers on a racially insensitive thing. They're like, this is terrible, we can't put this out. You have night, no time to go back and get rewrites or approvals. You've got to make calls on the fly. And so they tried to change it and Vince fired him. And... He said the first time he was with the company, he was tasked with creating a video package for the Mohammed Hassan Undertaker feud, Mm. leading to Great American Bash. You remember that disaster? He asked to work on a different project, as he felt the angle was insensitive, especially considered the London bombing in July of that year. They demoted me, he said. They didn't demote me financially, but they pretty much took away all my responsibilities at the time. But he was given his responsibilities back... After UPN insisted that Muhammad Hassan character no longer be shown on their network. <laughs> hey, so, yeah. pal, you got lucky these guys said something. We'll let it pass this time. Unbelievable. Un- Actually, very believable. What am I talking about? I was going to say, what's unbelievable about that? Not a, not a thing about any of it. Not a thing about it. And he could be lying about all of it, but I believe it. At this point in the game, with what I know about professional wrestling, with what I know about that company, with what I know about him after all these years, yeah, absolutely all of this fits. All of it. And there was that woman, I just want to say this, there was that woman, uh, the former writer, that sued and then ultimately dropped the suit. And there was a little bit of debate because she had talked about racially insensitive things and, and not having people of color and women in that room And, uh, you know, there was a little battle of, you know, this is like jokes, you know, this is art. You throw things at the wall, things get thrown around in there. They don't, you know, sometimes things land, they don't, you know, sometimes things get taken out of context or people take things the wrong way. Like, here's a case where there's no ambiguity at all with it. Like, these people feel uncomfortable here on Martin Luther King Day, which is always been a thing that i've always laughed at with vince that one of his heroes is martin luther king like he is the ultimate old man who you know their knowledge of civil rights in this country died when martin luther king did and that's all they know is the i have a dream speech and it's surface level nonsense and what a hero he was yet on that same show you're gonna have a white guy from newcastle england say you know big up the the people that are there and and override them and say that i have a dream even though they're all uncomfortable with it including the white guy from england who knows this isn't a good idea and yet you go ahead and do it anyway it's a it's a very frustrating very pro wrestling thing and as time moves on again there is a lot from the past that I wish kind of was, was still the same about wrestling, but in the ways that it is evolving, thank God that it is because there is a lot still from the past that needs to be flushed out of this thing. All right, I want to mention very quickly the uh, NXT show, 570,000 viewers and a point one six, and there was no real competition, and the show was down a lot, and I think some of you are well aware that uh, I may be the biggest NXT fan. But, uh, you know, Dave last night was, I don't know why, it was just down and blah. Well, the reason I, why is because... sucking wind. It sucks lately. Yeah, it does. And, it's uh, been like that. And listen, I'm saying that as a big fan. I want it to be better. I mean, we literally have... And, you know, as a plug, by the way, 
Yes. I've been I've been putting my uh, TV reviews up for subscribers. Started with Raw, and then I did NXT, and for like two days I heard no feedback. And I'm like, God, I worked my ass off on these. Like, and then today on the board, like a bunch of people came out of the woodwork to say they're really enjoying them. So, uh, did they like the new font? You should read the NXT review because there are three of the worst storylines in all of professional wrestling on the same show, okay? Three. Not one. Not like you used to watch and go, okay, that's the worst storyline in all of wrestling, but, you know, I enjoy the rest of the show or whatever. (laughs) We have three of the worst storylines in all of wrestling today on the same television show. So anyway, if you want my full NXT review talking about those, it's up. But that's that's to me the problem. Like I don't love the show as much as I used to. It's it's there's not as much good wrestling. You know the the storylines are three storylines that are atrocious, and uh, yeah, fix I'd it. Have, I'd have to go back and see where it was. It feels like it's been about a year now where they kind of hit the wall, and not everything is terrible. Obviously, because we've had Trick, we've had Ilya, we've had a lot of good things there, but. It has felt like they have been atrophying now for quite some time, and I think we're finally seeing it in the viewership here. And I know a couple months ago when they signed the deal, you're like, ah, who cares? You know, it does. You know, they they sign the new deal. It's about what they do on CW, and that is absolutely true. But it is amazing to watch these numbers fall in the way that they have. Where now, you know, there hasn't been a number this bad since July 4th of last year, and then you look back before that, and it's been a long time since they were at 500,000, and things have been trending down now for quite some time, so I don't know what they can do to kind of turn some things around. We'll see what they do coming out of WrestleMania and how they kind of recharge things after they're done with Trick and Mello, and they're going to do what they're going to do with Braun Breaker and Mello up on the main roster and all of that stuff, but... You know, it hasn't been good right now. What I worry about, though, is something that I asked you about a couple weeks ago, which is going to CW. Could you see a lot more of these goofy, bad storylines? Could we see a lot more Lyra and Tatum? I doubt it has to do with the network, but... I don't know, though, but... We've got three on one show, and they're on USA, brother. Uh, They're just bad. But here's my thing. Is it going to be better to see more acting? That's my thing is I don't know if it's going to be that much better on CW. In a way, it could be worse if they want to double and triple down on these skits and these backstage things and a lot of that stuff where that becomes a little bit more of the show than the wrestling is, if it's not already. All right, here's the notes from the Dynamite show last night. So, yes, Hangman, as we've noted countless times, he did a worked injury last week. Because he had a family situation that potentially was taking him off the pay-per-view. And he ended up getting it resolved a couple of days ago. And he will be working the pay-per-view. And so he came out, he faked an ankle injury, but then he jumped, swerved, hit him with a crutch, beat him down, and vowed that he would never let him win the title. So the three-way is still on for Sunday. And uh, we have... A very It's just weird because, like, Joe's a heel, but people love him. Swerve is a heel, but people love him. And Hangman has turned heel, but people love him. So I love the entrance, at least. That's where we are right now. No, they were <laughs> chanting for Hangman when he was on his crutches. He had told Babyface promo and then, and then beat him down. We had uh, FTR and Eddie Kingston versus Danielson, Claudio, and Moxley. And Brian Danielson made Eddie Kingston pass out in the triangle. I saw people on the board last night were furious because now they think Danielson's losing Sunday, which, to be fair, when I watch this, I thought the same thing. I love Eddie Kingston, but Brian Danielson needs to win a title, and he needs to be a champion, and he needs to beat people, and then he needs to put somebody over because all he wants to do is put people over, but it means less when you never actually win anything. Like, win something and then make a star. By having them beat you. That's what I believe. Eddie Kingston didn't need to be put over by Brian Danielson in this situation. I mean, I'm sure for Eddie that it's going to be a nice thing. But the reality of the situation is, listen to Eddie come out. Eddie's over. Eddie didn't need to be bequeathed by Brian Danielson. It's already been done. We had uh, the announcement that Meat Madness will not take place. Now, the only people that they announced for Meat Madness last week were Wardlow and Hobbs. And uh, who was the third guy? Oh, uh, I forget. But anyway, the point is, they had announced three of them last week, okay? 
Then they announce on this show, well, too many injuries. We're canceling it for now. We're going to do a scramble. And all three guys are in that match. So apparently there were Lance Archer. So mm. apparently there were people they hadn't announced that were going to be in the match who can't be in the match. And so they're not doing the match. Good, good. Don't do the stupid match. Warlow came out. You got a new chance with him. I know not everyone loved that promo, but that was as good of a turning of the page as you could get. Make this guy a killer. So what do you do? You put him in a match with a bunch of other dudes so people can chant meat. It's just, it, to me, there's a, you're doing the wrong thing with this dude. I'm sorry. You just do, you just are. We had uh, Nick Wayne losing Orange Cassidy. Good match. These guys could have a much better match, but it was good. Hopefully, they'll get another chance to do it again at some point. We had uh, Chris Jericho and Atlantis Jr., which really wasn't much. Atlantis Jr., I mean, he was here working American style, and if you're expecting, like, Vikingo or Hechicero or, you know, any of those guys, Mascar Dorada, you didn't get that here. He was, he was all right, and I did like that... Jericho puts him in the walls of Jericho. He almost gets to the ropes, but Jericho pulls him back to the middle. And his father threw in the towel for his son. I shed a tear. I love it. I did really like the finish a lot. Hey, and I like it. If nothing else, he's 53-year-old Chris Jericho. He couldn't do what Corazon de Leon did before, but at least he had the vest and the uh, the tights as well, too. You know, I miss Los Nuevos Gringos Locos. We'll never be able to get that back again, but I wish there was a way. And then at the end of the show, Sting came down from the rafters. Ric Flair ended up a babyface. Sting beat them all up, stood tall to end the show. Who's going to win? We'll discuss it after the break. Observer Live. you feel about your performance in the rumble um it went it went really well like all the girls were they made me look incredible um and thank god for that because like they're there they're that's they're there and they could the wwe fans can see them every week if they wanted to but that was i only have one chance like i felt like my career was riding on that <laughs> like that that's just how it felt and uh, for all the girls to just make me look as as good as they made me look, it was it was incredible. That moment with Naomi, a former Knockouts champion, you guys hug and then you guys start like just like going at it. What was that even like? Like was it deja vu? I don't know. She well, first of all, the reaction we got was so cool. Um, I thought I didn't I didn't expect like all the people to kind of know our history. So the fact that when we were standing off initially, they had that reaction, we hugged, they had a reaction, and then when we started fighting, they had a reaction. It was just, it was so perfect. It was chef's kiss. Um, that was so freaking cool. And the fact that we wrestled, what, two weeks ago in front of a sold-out crowd for TNA, their comeback show, like, for the Knockouts World title, everything was just so perfect. Yeah, she is an incredible athlete and an incredible wrestler, and... I never thought I'd be in the ring with her, at taking her finish, period. So the fact that that happened was actually crazy. Um, it, what's funny was when we, when everything, we were playing the match, whatever, um, and I said, have you ever done, you know, your finisher on the apron? And she said, no, she hadn't. We, we went over it in a practice ring. It wasn't working, and we didn't have a chance to go out. We know that the, the ring aprons are bigger outside, uh, but we didn't have a chance to go out and, like, feel it out. And one of the producers was like, you don't have to have to do it if y'all didn't go over it. And I just told her, like, do it. And if there's not enough room, just throw me on the ground. Like, just do it from the apron to the ground. And thank God that didn't happen. But <laughs> I, I, was tell I was telling the producer, like, I would do this in front of 500 people, much less 50,000 people. So I didn't have a problem with it at all. And uh, she's an amazing wrestler. And I feel like, she would have protected me regardless of if we had to do it to the floor or not. <laughs> yes. I was like, when I was watching it, I was nervous because I'm like, first of all, like you're taking this brutal bump. But then on top of that, Bianca, we know was supposed to be standing tall. And I was like, oh my God, what if she like loses her balance? What if she falls oh. too? Like I was thinking like all of these things, but you guys went, I mean, you guys are pros, man. She's so good. No, no chance of that. She would have been fine. No, she would have no. just, she would have fallen off the apron and landed on my body. And like, <laughs> <laughs>
Back in the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Like Semper VB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. In my mind, what I envision is Sting losing to the Young Bucks, but then an incredible post-match ceremony. Luger out there. Ric Flair, obviously. Huge celebration, hugging the Young Bucks. Trying to find a way to send those fans home happy despite him losing. But I think he should win. That's my call. But I ain't making those calls. So we'll see what happens. Who do you think is winning, Mike? I want it to be Sting and Darby. In fact, I think it will be Sting and Darby. And I think we'll finally get a good use of those ratings when they decide to rate the top eight teams for who is going to take these belts after Sting and Darby lay them on the mat after that big ceremony and Sting says his final goodbye. More than that, now I just want to know who's going to show up. Who are they going to get to come in and be there to celebrate Sting and this final match in North Carolina? Because it is going to be something else and it is going to be very emotional. And one thing that they have going for them, even though the build to this pay-per-view, as many can be complained about with AEW, is not there. You have a one match that there's a lot of people that want to see, and there's going to be a lot of people that pay for it to see Sting for the final time. It's amazing. It's amazing. After all these years, he's been there almost my whole wrestling life. Saw him start off in Mid-South, and now we get to see his last match. Amazing career. We're out of time, everybody. I'll be back tonight with Vinny. We'll have an hour and a half to talk AEW, and yes, NXT. Vinny and I will review NXT tonight, as well as AEW Dynamite. Got a lot to get into, and that's it, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.